A very good evening, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to join you all for this discussion this evening as part of the Amit Kathrada Foundation's program for Anti-Racism Week as, and as part of the Anti-Racism Network of South Africa. Um, I'd like to begin by just introducing myself. I'm Irfan Mangera, the Youth Activism Program Manager at the Foundation. Um, and we've had a very exciting and engaging week so far. It was meeting with schools, the deputy minister just two days ago in another webinar, and so many other activations. Anti-Racism Week is held in South Africa during Human Rights Month. It culminates on Human Rights Day and the International Day of the Elimination of for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. This Action Week aims to create public awareness about racism and the effects it has on individuals and on broader society. It's about ensuring that there's the reactive responses where you see throughout the year where things flare up. This Anti-Racism Week is really about how do we keep engaging uh, more than just um, responding to issues of racism, but discussing and debating how we take forward this issue, how we solve these issues and how we create the space for engagement around this. Now, while Anti-Racism Week is initiated by the Anti-Racism Network of South Africa, known as ANSA, it also aims to get all sectors of society involved and encourages self-initiated activities during the week. Others would have hosted dialogues, debates, book, book, book um, launches, etc. The purpose of this session, however, is engaging around equality courts. What are equality courts? And this Anti-Racism Week event seeks to educate the public on things related to equality courts. The equality courts are a legislative tool that should be utilized to curb the scourge of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and South Africa created equality courts under the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act of 2000. Equal access to courts is recognized as a fundamental human right in this plethora of human rights issues and treaties. This right is critical because it facilitates access to and protection of other rights. Since the first equality courts were opened in 2003, they have been the site of some notable human rights victories. Today we gathered um, for a discussion around equality courts, and I'm happy now to introduce and pass the mic over to Ritabila Ratsomo and Alan Tambo from the Human Rights Commission, who will take us further into discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I think my colleague Irfan has really just simplified why it is that we're gathered here today. And I'd just like to kick off with this question and answer session with Alan from the South African Human Rights Commission. Alan, we're really just going to start off by just understanding what exactly are the equality courts and what role and purpose do they play in our within our legal justice system? All right, um, good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going straight to it. Uh, if you look at, <laughs> if you have a look at our Equality Act, the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, which was passed in 2000, um, it determines in its purpose, firstly, that uh, it wants to prevent and prohibit unfair discrimination in the country. Um, and then it provides for remedies where people can go to courts where ha they have been uh, victims or uh, have had such unfair discrimination uh, perpetrated against them. Uh, and that remedy is firstly the equality courts. Um, chapter four of Papuda is what establishes our equality courts. Um, and their purpose are, as I've mentioned, to ensure that where there has been unfair discrimination and harassment um, that people can access courts. Uh, yeah, let me let me pause there before I, I go for too long. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, in what instances can one approach the equality courts? So yes, it would be in instances, or let me, before I even answer that question directly, I think it's, uh, it's important to understand that equality courts are 
established to be informal in nature. So um, they are over 380 quality courts across the country, uh, magistrates courts and high courts all function as equality courts. Uh, and, the, and if you visited them, which I have visited quite a few, they are designed to be more informal and not really require a complainant to have a lawyer in most cases. Um, they, they are designed in a way that any person can walk in and, and start the process of, of lodging a complaint. Um, so uh, of course then uh, they are easy to access access and, and easy to use on, on any given day. Um, they, of course, as I said, there's quite a lot of them, so you don't have to worry about finding one and we see that they aren't actually used as much as they should. Um, yeah, so let me pause there in the meantime. Thank you, Alan. I'm not sure you quite answered the question yet, but we want to understand in what instances can one approach the Equality Court? So in, in all instances of uh, unfair discrimination and harassment, so um, that can be under the grounds of race or any ground that has, has been listed in, in our constitution in section nine uh, and in Bermuda, there are several. So it's race, gender, ethnicity, um, pregnancy, age, and so on. Uh, if you feel that your rights have been violated, your right to equality has been violated on those grounds, then you can access, you can go to an equality court and, and lodge a complaint. <clears throat> there are occasions where you can approach an equality court where it is not on a listed ground. So it can be a ground that does not exist on this list, uh, but then there are usually different processes um, aligned with those. So from the way I understand it, right, um, the, the, the things that you've just listed now is what people can approach the equality court for um, in terms of unfair discrimination, right? The, yes. the, the, the equality courts also cover unfair discrimination, hate speech, as well as harassment. Maybe you can just give us a clear explanation of exactly what those are. Okay, so hate speech is defined in section 10 of, of the Puda. Um, it, it's, it really involves any speech that um, creates harm or has an intent uh, to create harm or violence, right? Uh, our constitution also defines it in three ways. Uh, but if you look at section 10, which when I say has been controversial, it was the, the context uh, under which uh, the more recent Golani case was, was tried. And uh, at least in the case of the commission, most of the equality or hate speech matters that we had at the time had all been paused, uh, awaiting this, this particular uh, judgment, which had taken over 10 years uh, to come to an end. So if you do look at section 10.1, it's either that it be hurtful or propagate or promote hatred. Um, what, uh, what this judgment had done is that it had found that hurtful was no longer constitutional, because uh, obviously they were of the view that hurting someone and offending someone was something that was still protected by freedom of speech. Whereas where you harm and you actually create a psychological harm or create the type of harm that has historically been found to be racist or harmful, um, then you have um, hate speech, right? Uh, if we look at harassment, harassment tends to be an area that is often misunderstood and perhaps underused, right? Uh, because we often think that it has to do with continuous um, abuse or of someone's dignity. But if you look at the uh, harassment definition in Bukuda, it speaks about unwanted conduct, uh, which is either persistent or serious, or demeans, humiliates, or creates a hostile or intimidating environment. So it kind of includes a little bit of bullying, a bullying as well. Um, and the point is that it should somehow demean or induce submission or threat um, or threaten adverse consequences to a person. Um, so often these are on, it, it lists uh, grounds such as sex, gender, and sexual orientation, um, but it honestly can be broader than that. It can be bullying based on um, your workplace environment and someone working above or below you, right? Um, yeah, so I think unfair discrimination pretty much is it's defined in several ways. If you look at um, section, um, I think it's section six of Kapura. Yes, correct. 
So it, it, it doesn't, it simply just says that uh, a state cannot unfairly discriminate against any person. But what it does is then it goes in section seven, eight and nine into the different types of unfair discrimination under race, disability and gender more specifically. Uh, and what you find that is common in all of these is it usually has to do with some kind of propaganda idea, uh, a policy or practice within a, a given area, whether it's a workplace or whether it's um, by government or any other person, um, any type of exclusion uh, on the basis of a person's race or gender or um, ability or disability. Um, and often we've also, we've started to look at this as an omission as well. So when you have a problem of race, in your institution and you have omitted to do something about it though it has come to your attention. Um, so those are some of the things that you'd find under unfair discrimination. Thank you so much, Alan. I think that really has made things a bit clearer. Um, I wonder if you can just take us through who, who actually is able to bring a matter forward to the Equality Court. Is it only the alleged victim in the situation? Can another organization uh, bring about the matter to the Equality Court? Who exactly is able to bring the matter to the Equality Court? Okay, so anyone can bring a matter to the Equality Court. It can be a person working um, that is complaining for their own interest or because of a matter that's happened to them. Uh, it can be a person who is acting on behalf of another. Um, and by person, that obviously doesn't just mean an individual person. It also refers to a person such as institutions. So for example, the Human Rights Commission can raise a complaint on behalf of you. Um, it can be a person acting on a group of people as well, or class of people. So it can, you don't only have to act for one person or anyone acting in the public interest. Um, in terms of institutions, obviously it's the Human Rights Commission and the Gender uh, Commission, the Commission for Gender Equality that can bring matters to the Equality Court as an institution um, and have a standing before the court. Um, yeah, so the, that's, the, yeah, that's the simple answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, so when you do take a matter to the Equality Court, um, is it necessary to be able to have your evidence all together? And if so, what kind of evidence or substantiation would you need to succeed in the Equality Court? Well, yes, obviously, it being a court, you still do have to have your, your evidence together. And what you would really, as a complainant, what you would need to do is to demonstrate that there has been unfair discrimination. So you would have to um, either show that it's on the ground, like race and so on. And, and once you've done that, then it really falls on the respondent uh, to prove that there wasn't unfair discrimination. And if there was, they need to prove um, that there was a purpose to that discrimination and it wasn't unfair. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Uh, you know, we've often heard in South Africa just how inaccessible uh, you know, legal systems can be. You mentioned earlier that uh, equality courts are quite informal in nature, but maybe you could just take us through the process of what someone would need to undergo in the equality court and what associated costs would come with it? Um, well, on cost, given that uh, it isn't something where you need to necessarily hire lawyers, uh, it's something that you could do with very little cost, right? Um, it is intended for the public to benefit from in general. Um, it starts with approaching the court and I think I'll speak a bit about some of the challenges we're finding in that respect. But it starts really with approaching the court um, and, and getting in touch with the clerk who will give you what is called a form two form, where you kind of fill out the details of what has happened um, and what you seek to, to get from the court. Uh, the, 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 the quality court clerk is the person who then runs with your complaint uh, and takes it through all the different processes, brings it before the presiding officer, and there are set days which, which are prescribed to these processes. So it could, uh, uh, the prescribing officer, for example, which would be a judge or magistrate, would have um, seven to 10 days to make a final decision on whether they will take the matter or whether they will refer to another organization or to a, another court. Um, so it doesn't require cost so much. And usually within the first um, about 17 days, you're able to have a decision on whether your matter will be taken up by that court. 
Um, there are also a few developments in that respect where there are now rules that if a matter is taken up by the Equality Court, then there also needs to be a demonstration that uh, there was an attempt to mediate the matter before it is heard by the court. Um, this is a more recent development in 2020, uh, which has the purpose of reducing the amount of cases that are brought to judges in general, particularly in the High Court. Um, and usually you do have to have a certificate that has shown that you have attempted to mediate, and if not, why not, basically, yeah. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, you know, you did mention that there's little to no cost associated with bringing a matter to the Equality Court, but we've seen, you know, writings extensively on the fact that Equality Courts are underutilized. Why is it, do you think? Yeah, so there are two primary reasons that we are seeing as leading to the lack of utilization. Um, the one is the general lack of knowledge, obviously, of, of people, particularly in more disadvantaged areas. So if you go to magistrates courts, you'll find that they are usually in, in more rural areas um, and, and informal settlements. And the majority of people around that court are, are not aware that they can actually utilize the court. Um, of course, the Department of Justice together with other institutions like the Human Rights Commission and the Gender Commission have a, an obligation and a duty to, to promote uh, equality and also promote this understanding of our courts. So that is something that obviously we do in these areas, but just the, I don't know if it's um, a lack of confidence in the, in, the, in the system itself, but just generally there's this lack of knowledge of, of the fact that you can use an equality court. Um, now the second is what we have seen, particularly in our inspection, that we have done over the last two years after lockdown has started to calm down a little bit, is that there is generally a lack of preparedness on the side of the equality court um, to deal with equality matters, right? And what I mean by that is uh, the Equality Act is quite clear and quite prescriptive uh, in, in saying that number one, that judges, for example, and presiding officers cannot oversee an equality matter if they are not trained. Uh, it says the same for equality court clerks. Uh, and usually there's an expectation, thirdly, that um, there would be a, a separate kind of court set up just for the equality court so that you can shine that kind of informal type approach. Um, our inspections in several provinces have demonstrated to us that the majority of judges have either not received training at all or have received training more than 15 to 20 years ago. Um, so they almost are out of touch with what it requires. Uh, we have found that almost none uh, out of the courts that you've gone to, none of them have had equality court clerks that have been trained, but just equality court clerks that are there and present uh, if they are there, which hasn't been the case in many cases. Uh, there's only one court out of maybe six or eight that we've gone to in the last two years where there's actually been a separate room for the equality cases, which has that whole informal um, approach. But in all of those cases, many of the courts, particularly in the more informal settlements, have not had a case since 2019. Um, the ones that are more in, in cities, such as Kimberley, where there are big high courts, for example, are the ones that are getting cases. And even that in that instance, it's two cases. Uh, it isn't anything to write home about, basically. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, that's quite interesting to hear. Is there a plan to improve, uh, you know, the standard of training on one side, but also to make sure that everyone is trained to the adequate level? Yes. So obviously the training is carried out by the Department of Justice. Um, and they are the ones that need generally have to Put out a call for training and encourage judges and magistrates to go on and, and, and take this training. Um, from the perspective of the Human Rights Commission, we have taken it upon ourselves to find a list uh, and we've written to Sajay and, and uh, the Office of the Chief Justice to ask for a list of uh, trained judges in the last couple of years and they've supplied us with a list of about, um, I think, a hundred different trainings that have happened and who the attendees have been over the last couple of years. 
Um, but then we've also written to them to bring to their attention the need for more training, given that we live in a more digital era um, and the training itself has become a lot more uh, online, more so than in person. We have asked for, for, for the training to be extended to more judges and more magistrates more presiding officers. So we, we have a lot more who are up to date with development. Like I just mentioned to you, um, possibly in the next year or the next six months, uh, Papula does need to be amended in terms of section 10. Um, and that change is something that judges and magistrates need to be brought up to speed with as well. So it's almost an entire refresher for anyone who has had a training as well. Um, so we have also considered whether as a, as a chapter nine institution, we should be partnering with justice to ensure that we can also carry our training. Um, but that's something that's still under discussion with justice and, and uh, hopefully that's something that we can do in the future as a human rights commission. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, I think it's good to know that there is a plan in place currently. Where could people find more information on the nearest equality court to them? Is there a list somewhere, a website they can visit? How do people find this information? Um, yes, so the Department of Justice website, usually when it is, it is in working order, um, has a list of, of courts uh, across the country, equality courts. Um, so that, that's the best way to find it. But as I said, with all high courts, and magistrate courts being equality courts. It generally means that if there's a if there's a magistrate court around you and a high court around you, it is an equality court. Uh, one of the things we have found sometimes is that when you arrive at the court, it might not be clear uh, through the signage or whatever that there's actually an equality court here, right? Um, so you might end up having to ask around, and that's one of the things we brought to the attention of the different um, kind of political heads in each province that the signage in this court is not appropriate and we'd like there to be more signing so people know when they arrive here there's an equality court. Um, and of course they have taken up that, that call. Most of them do have signage, which is great on the part of justice that they have, you know, increased the amount of signage in courts, but some of them don't. Um, yeah, so on the website and 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 through just visiting your, your closest court. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ellen. What are some of the sanctions that can be imposed in the equality court if someone is found guilty of either unfair discrimination, hate speech, or harassment? Yeah, so it's important to emphasize for, for those that are um, less legally inclined that an equality court is, is a civil court. What that means is that it doesn't consider criminal matters. It looks to resolve um, what might be disagreements between people in what would tend to be, though it can give orders and so on, would tend to be more amicable, right? Um, so what it can do is it can order, um, or the, the trend that we're seeing with the cases that we bring is it's either a fine or an apology or both. So if, if it's something, if it's something that relates to race, you're expecting either a fine um, or an apology. It can be anything from, um, 50,000 Rand to anything 2,050,000 Rand, right? 250,000 Rand. Um, there are cases where we've even asked for more um, than that, but uh, we're still in the process of seeing those for, uh, unfold. Um, yeah, so, so definitely in most cases an apology. Um, there are other orders like declaratory orders and interim orders, but I, I suppose in order to not get too technical on that, um, I, I can I can leave that for the moment, but yeah, just to know that it's usually an apology or, or fine. Um, and I would say that, of course, the commission is not of the view that paying a fine stops or changes a person's mind when they have racist inclinations. Um, yes, it might make them apologize for that one thing, but when they leave it, they might still have the same biases um, that they had when they had committed the first offense, right? Um, which is why in most of the orders that we ask for, we also include a, a requirement to do a diversity training, uh, diversity and inclusion training or sensitivity training, as you, as you might call it. So that there's actually a change in the person's behavior or you're expecting that there would be a change in the person's behavior. 
um, yeah. No, thank you so much, Alan. I just want to pick up on a point that you just mentioned there, just about uh, you know the difference between the criminal court system as well as the equality courts. Uh, you know, the Vicky Mamba uh, case, for instance, was quite phenomenal because it was one of those instances that we saw quite a large uh, fine or sanction imposed on a perpetrator found guilty of crimin criminal urea, right? But there's been quite a, not quite a clear understanding in terms of the difference in the dispensation of justice between the two. Maybe if you could just give us more of an example of that and just try to explain to us a bit more about that. Yeah, um, so usually when you go through the criminal route for a matter that is racial, um, without the physical component of it, uh, it is usually through what is called criminal new year, uh, which is something that comes obviously from Roman Dutch law. Uh, and what happens with criminal new year is it's a case where there's a willful injury to someone's dignity, which is caused by obscene or racially uh, offensive language or gestures. Um, so though it can be just general race, uh, racial language or gestures, the general understanding is that it's usually something that is quite serious. Um, and if you if you have a look at some of the provisions in the hate crimes and hate speech bill that's currently being considered uh, or being being uh, circulated, uh, it is that same understanding that is usually for the more egregious cases of racism, right? Um, and it's in those circumstances that uh, it can usually go through SAPs and through the criminal system. Um, but also the uh, criminal, I mean the uh, Equality Court does have the power to make an order where they can send a matter to the MPA for further consideration. So if a matter comes before the Equality Court, they feel that this is actually more, I mean, we've made our order, but we feel that further action needs to be taken. They can, they can send it to the MPA for further consideration. So yeah, the difference there is that yes, you can go to jail uh, in such circumstances. Um, but given the context that we're in as a country, Obviously, we as the Commission have continued to agree that it should be in egregious cases where that path is taken, uh, where issues can be resolved amicably. Uh, generally, we, it is preferred that there's that, you know, uh, diversity and, and change that comes in the understanding of a person uh, prior to us taking more serious action uh, and, and seeing them go to jail. But of course, we don't hesitate when, when we see such a case uh, arise. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that does give just a clearer understanding of the difference. Um, I just want to know from you, you know, the, the famous equality court cases that we have uh, seen have taken quite a while. And earlier you mentioned that, you know, a decision can be taken even within 17 days. What is the cause of some of the delays that we see happening over some matters brought to the equality court? Uh, well, I think I was saying that a decision on accepting your equality court matter can take about 17 days, but it being finalized is another story. It being heard and, and, and a judgment being given is another story. Um, so I think when you, when you have a look at some of um, the reasons being given by justice and the judiciary is that um, the court system is quite overwhelmed and stands. Uh, and there is already a significant backlog of cases. So even though you, your equality court case might be slightly different, you still have the same judge who has other matters sitting on their, on their, on their desk, right? Um, so it is generally a backlog that results in this. Um, but in general, I think we can say that the justice system is slightly slow at the moment, right? And possibly over the last couple of years. Um, like I said, the Golani matter took over 12 years to complete from beginning to end. Um, so if you are going to appeal the matter, um, you know that it's going to take a couple of years. It's not going to be a short journey. Um, but if it's something that can be resolved in the court to court, it, it can be done uh, in, in a shorter time frame, which usually can be anything from a year to three or four years, depending on the complexity, depending on the evidence, depending on cooperation by both sides as well. I mean, you just also mentioned, you know, this backlog that um, the legal system, the justice legal system has within South Africa. And quite a number of people have brought up the fact that, you know, equality courts are not as well resourced as they should be. Is there a plan perhaps to, 
you know, fund the development of the equality courts or will it continue to remain the way that it is right now? Um, I'm not aware of a plan to, to develop um, equality courts in that extent. Um, and also I think it's very difficult to argue for it when there isn't a demand, right? So it's, it's that if there's only, I mean, on average, there are two cases per court um, in the whole country uh, per year. So well, that means that there isn't a high demand for those resources. Um, yes, they might not be prepared, but it's almost a balancing act where you want to enable the court to be prepared, but also you want people to use it so that it can justify that growth in, in capacitating the equality courts. So I think um, it's a matter, at least for the commission at this point, that the court should be well prepared to begin with. Uh, and as, as people start to use it more, then it makes sense that of course, it be have more people who are trained uh, working in the courts. Yeah. I mean, despite like you're saying, only two cases being brought perhaps in a year, we have seen quite just a number of victories being won at the Equality Court, um, you know, different instances. Maybe you can just share a couple with us just to, you know, encourage also people to understand that, you know, change does come about by going to the Equality Court. Oh yeah, there are several, <laughs> there are several. Um, I would say uh, the Golani matter is one of them that took the commission a very long time. Um, and one that we are generally really happy with the outcome um, because of the amount of time invested into it. Um, and also the just the cost uh, that the commission had to take on in going to all of these different uh, platforms, the high court, the Supreme Court, and then the constitutional court. Um, it remains a very important case in, in how we deal with hate speech in the future. Um, you will be aware that parliament was ordered to amend Peppuda within a year of the judgment. So we are coming to within 24 months and we are coming to the end of that 24 month period. So we're more or less looking for, for what will happen. Um, the commission takes equality court matters throughout the country uh, and we generally find success in them. Uh, although not a race case, and, uh, yeah, but more like a hate speech related case. We more recently had a favorable finding uh, in the Eastern Cape against Steve Hockmeyer, who had said some uh, some very astonishing things about the LGBTI sector. Uh, and he was also required to pay a fine and undergo uh, the training that we have suggested. Um, there are more I can speak of, including in Nipopo, where we had a transgender person who was being discriminated against, um, and we had an order in our favor. So, I mean, generally, when we take matters to the equality court, we, we do take them under really great consideration. So we don't just run there, um, and we often have our cases found in our favor. Um, yeah, so I would say there are many cases where these, these turn out great. Uh, I, I have less information on cases where people have represented themselves, obviously, because I haven't been involved. Um, but yeah, I, I would I would have it in my mind that it would the, the, it would be similar outcomes if you have a good case. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, for me, the first thing that comes to mind as well is the Jade September case in the Western Cape uh, as a transgender person in jail. So there have been some great victories that have been made by the Equality Courts. Maybe if you could just take us step by step for someone who's looking to perhaps bring a matter to the Equality Court, what is it, everything that they need to know? What should they prepare themselves for? Just step by step before we take questions from the audience. Yeah, so like, like I'd already mentioned, um, the first step is really going and filling out the form, um, preparing yourself for all of the evidence you need. Uh, I suppose it's not as simple as just saying, X called me this. Um, yes, you, I mean, in some cases you don't have the evidence, um, but you can bring witnesses forward that would speak to the fact. Um, so it's just generally having that good understanding of what you're going to argue and with who, who you need to support you. Um, and often that's why people come to a chapter nine, so that they understand better what they need to put together, right? Um, and then it's being prepared for the different processes that take place. Um, and also having the time frames in mind, right? Um, that these things aren't always as, as, as quick as you'd like them to be. And we often find that by the time people do come to 
the courts or to the commission, it's already been some time that's passed and they're more frustrated with, what, with their attempts. Um, like I said, there's also this, this requirement these days to, to, to have tried to mediate. Uh, and I know uh, in certain cases, it might be tenuous when, when you know, when you're hurting, when you're feeling quite heavily offended by something that's been said to you, or whether you've actually lost something as a result or been at the end of violence. Um, it's very hard for someone to now try and sit and mediate with uh, the, the opposite party. Uh, but I think in general, one has to be prepared to do so, unless uh, there are good reasons why not. I mean, whether it's an urgent matter, for example, or whether it's something that's just um, not amicable from the perspective of the person complaining. Um, then obviously being prepared for some, like I said, like something like an apology and a fine, more so than someone going to jail. I know uh, a lot of people want to see that type of justice coming out of their racial disagreement. Uh, and that's really not the, the ambit of the Equality Court in most cases. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alan. I know for myself, um, you know, I definitely learned a lot more. Um, we're just going to take any questions. If there's questions from the audience, uh, you can just raise your hand and we will unmute you. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any questions. I mean, I think that is just a sign that you did a very great job at just taking us through the process and giving us a bit more understanding about equality courts. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alan. I'm just going to hand over back to my colleague, Irfan. Hi, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm, I think the light is a bit bad where I'm at, but um, nonetheless, that was an awesome session. I really learned a lot, Alan. I honestly didn't know much about the Equality Courts as well. And I think there's so much room for us to take this information into our programming and to our work. You know, yesterday at, a, at an assembly, um, at we'd, we've been doing these um, school assemblies against racism and one of the young people they had asked you know the different methods of taking this forward and our given response often is around the app as a human rights commission um, if it's a grave issue around um, violence that can be taken up by SAPs often that is the case um, and I think this question of the equality courts really coming to play quite strongly and the fact that it is accessible um, helps us um, promote it a lot more. Um, honestly, that was uh, a, a very useful and beneficial um, session with yourself. Uh, I really like to thank you for spending this uh, hour with us um, with the Katrada Foundation. Um, it has been a really great um, session. Thanks to everyone else for joining. I think it we all can agree that there's stuff we can take from here. Um, and particularly to my colleague Rita Bile for arranging and organizing this uh, this session in the in our con in conversation series during anti-racism week. So it's a uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all and wish you all the best. And please do follow our social media pages for other programs and events that are still happening. For the remainder of anti-racism week and also the human rights festival which will have some of these discussions next weekend at the constitution hill thank you all so much and have a good evening thank you friend thank you everyone goodbye thank you everyone